You see me standing on that side of the guitar where Jimmy was today. Let's have, I just want to thank our worship team and tech crew. Let's give them a hand. Mi compadres. I love them very much. I'm the worship pastor here for some of you that are new. And um, typically, Pastor and I have been talking about this, like when it comes to worship, that's when he would like for me to share in the preaching. So I'm very grateful for that. And most of you may not know either, I have a, a, an international ministry called worshipteamtraining.com. is where you can find us. And I, where I, I speak, I go through the country, I talk to churches about what, we're, what we just got through doing, worship, and what today's topic is going to be. You can find a lot of my stuff, if you haven't already, on a version. We're on there. Just search Brandon Dempsey. Just, yeah, just, it's okay. You can pop out your phone, sir. You got to get your Bible anyway. So why not go to version? Just type in Brandon Dempsey worship team training, and then you'll find me there. I got, we got devotionals. We have um, all sorts of things that you can read because a lot of what I'm going to be speaking about today has everything to do with what we're going to be discovering together in today's time. And I'd like to start out today with a, a prayer that David starts out with in Psalm 143, 8. Let's pray together. David says, let the morning bring me word of your unfailing love, for I have put my trust in you. Show me the way I should go. For to you, I entrust my life. Lord Jesus, come and teach to us in this time. Help me to divide your word correctly. In Jesus' name, amen. So as a child or adult, you've been, have you been falsely, falsely accused of doing something that wasn't right? Yes. Okay, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever been told that you were causing trouble when you're trying to do good? Yes. Now, now, we got a police officer in here, so he's watching, okay? <laughs> I'm kidding. How did it feel? Not good. When you're accused of doing something that you thought you were trying to do right. Maybe that happened in school, in work. What's it like when you see the other person rightly justified when you know that there's something not right. How did that make you feel? Maybe you passed up, they passed up a, a job over you or something in school or something that you wanted in life and that other person got it. How did that feel? Not too good. It's happened to me. It's happened to every one of us in this room. Other instances, let's uh, go to Facebook status updates and Instagram. How many people liked what you posted last night? Could that be the first thing that you check in the morning when you wake up? Some people do. I used to. And has a friend ever blocked you because maybe you posted something that was godly? You thought they were a friend and not anymore because they put up that God stuff and I'm just not about that. And maybe you thought, wow, I, I thought we were friends and that just didn't happen. All because you made choices, godly choices, about something that you posted about your beliefs and values. Pastor Brian spoke last week about choosing what is right in the, even in the face of doing wrong when others are doing something wrong. Even in the church, people denounce the faith. Even in the church, people don't act like Christians. Have you ever seen that? You haven't seen that, have you? which in turn has a huge effect on the way people worship. Huge. You and I. Much of the time, we choose to worship. It says a lot about what we believe about God. So, is your worship true or false? Is your worship true or false? Do you really care about the way that you worship? Why does that matter? Because it matters to God. We don't think about that. We usually think, well, just come in here, sing a few songs, put my hands together, act like I'm worshiping, just so that people know I'm 
somehow godly, and yet maybe God will look upon me and see that I'm doing good. It's kind of like our Instagram lives, right? We want everything posted perfectly. When you know in your heart that in that picture, just those three people are not the 20,000 people that you think you're surrounding yourself with. Well, we all do it. So on a warm September morning, about 100, 100 of us gathered at the main square. You could feel the breeze in the air. You can hear the cheers of football. You can feel the excitement that's happening through the campus. Footsteps of people hurrying in different directions. And, and no matter, the sound of the school campus was no match for the monotone, bellowing campus, uh, campus tour guide that had a voice that only Ben Stein could love, calling out Bueller, Bueller, Bueller. So in this man's, gentleman's attempt, we scurried from one campus to the side of the other, and already we're exhausted and disoriented about where we we're going. And the tour guide pointed out several signs and buildings upon the campus about what was and where you're going. He also seemed to be quite pretentiously enthusiastic about different religions as we came to the religious center talking about how those that want to worship God this way, go here. Those who want to worship Buddha, go here. Those who, every, it's like, there was like eight different, I was, I was amazed. Now, this is University of Houston. Um, I spent much of my life growing up in Houston. I'm so glad that God saved us to come to Austin, okay? <laughs> so, thank you, God. This is where we, life begins. So, we're learning about all these different places, and then we get to the part of the Christian fellowship building in which he remarked, and this is where the Christians go. Now, some of you may laugh or you may be shocked, but that's kind of the world that we live in, right? So, that stood out to me, but it seemed to be that his wheels kind of deflated by the time that we got there. It's like he was so enthused about talking about other gods that were false, but when we came to the part of what was true, he just lost his steam. You feel that way? You get so revved up about other things in the world that when it comes to learning what God has for you, you're kind of like, um, maybe next week. Not now, God. So, so much of us, we go over there, but I guess that the tour guide wasn't too politically correct after all. Some people try to find a God that will pray to fit their needs. Others try to find a God that, will, that they can worship to maybe uh, fulfill their selfish desires, their need for pride. The truth is, and this is what Pastor Darrell had said, which I love, false gods promise what only the true God provides. False gods promise what only the true God provides. When it comes to worship in the Christian church, I believe that we also strive for the same thing. Who is true? What is false? Has anyone ever told you, go ahead, do this. You won't get hurt. <laughs> we say the opposite to our kids. Don't do this, you'll get hurt. <laughs> that happened this morning. And have you ever had these thoughts? Well, I know what the law says, but I'm going to do this anyway. Maybe driving here this morning? Okay. Again, we all do it, all right? Or I know I shouldn't do this because I, because I, I know I said so. I want to do it anyway. Now, do any of these false answers or misleading directions hold up to their promises? The questions you were seeking, did they provide the answers you wanted? False directions, false hope, false worship. False gods, again, provide only what the true God provides. So our text comes from 1 Kings 18. As you see, the books of the Bible that we are going through throughout the whole year. I think we have like another year and a half or two left, Brian. Elijah was sent by God to one of the world's worst of the worst rulers. His name was King Ahab. Turn again, the people back of Israel, back to God. 
Elijah met his predecessor, Obadiah. Obadiah was also a priest during the time of Nehemiah, sent by God. Ahab was so enraged about God's people, about God's prophets, because he want, Ahab wanted to continue his worship, his way, his sin in the dark. He did not want God in his life. He did not want Elijah to shine that light. Anybody ever come around you to shine that light on you? And say, hey, you thought about this? And you're like, well, uh, hold on a second. The Israelites, too, were caught up in false worship. The reality of worshiping a false god named Baal. But they continued to turn their backs on God and to worship in sin without care. It's funny how the history of man and the world never changes. We still do these things today. We just call it something different. It was an interesting circumstance that in the center of rebellion against God, there was one whose devotion was so intense, so dedicated, so admirable, and distinguished that this man's name was called Elijah. It's horrible to find a Judas among the apostles, so it is grand to discover Elijah in the presence of Ahab. See that paradigm, that parallel? So no matter how the Israelites prayed to Baal, nothing was going to save them from the fire that was so bright, so devastating, so engulfing, that would consume them utterly. So number one, who will you worship? Are you choosing things in your life that are true or choosing things in your life that are false? As far as our nature, the things that we know are false are the things that we also worship because we are bound to sin. We worship things that are false every day. We first wake up, just talk about that, your social feed. You can't go through a day without having somebody else's approval. Ever try that? That didn't work. We feel like we can't make it in life unless we have the success that we desire or that we think that we need or want. We can't overcome it until we feel like we have enough money or enough security. It's, it's like, you know, the Breaking Bad episode where they asked Walter White, how much money is enough? What's enough? And he said, more. Pastor Darrell's going to be talking about that in our next series to come in Proverbs. Psalms 27 says, Some trust in chariots, some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. Who's come today to hear the word? And we are going to feast, 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 because that's what it's about. I just love, I love what God's word has to say. So we have our lesson here in 1 Kings 18, 20, 21. When Ahab saw Elijah, he said to him, Is that you, troubler of Israel? He called him troubler. This is Ahab making fun, calling him names already. It's like someone, you know, at work or school that says, Oh, here comes so-and-so. That ever happen? You get that? How'd that make you feel? But coming from Ahab, it was much more indignant. He was reducing Elijah's identity, demeaning him of his own integrity. Ahab just didn't care. He wanted Elijah to be burned up. That sounds like most people that attack God's chosen ones are the church. Ahab was the real one causing trouble. And now, protecting his evil behavior, Elijah, and Ahab is the one calling him troublemaker. It's interesting how when you project your fault and sin and shortcomings on somebody else, you being called a liar for something that you didn't do, being heckled, made fun of, they minimize and squash your sense of integrity, your personhood. But you know what they can't ever do is take your integrity away. 
no matter how much you've been hurt in life, no matter what someone said about you, even your parents. We go through all of our lives trying to validate the empty need that was given to us that our parents could not fill. You may have grown up in a house where they said, you know what, if you're good enough, this would have happened. Or you know what, you're not good enough and this is why it's not going to happen. I used to come home making C's and D's. And my dad just, it's like nothing was good enough. Well, that could have been a B, Brandon. Then I make a B. Well, that could have made it A, Brandon. And you know what I, stopped, you know what I did after that? I stopped making A's and B's because I was resentful. Because I didn't want the glory to go to my dad for him to validate who I was and what I was doing in school. I wanted the true validation to come from God. So you know what happened? When I got in college, I made the A's and B's that God's called me to because I was no longer pressured by living under the rule of my mom or dad. But sadly, we still go through those things in life. Even myself today, I have old tapes that happen. But you know what the truth is about tapes? God's not called you to play them. God's called you to crush them. And I say this to our worship team all the time. The Lord loves you deeply. Why? Because you're his kid. You're nobody else's. It takes a long time. It takes years to figure out that truth, to know that you're so loved. It can take a whole lifetime for those scales to fall off where you just realize deep in your heart how much God truly, truly, deeply loves you more than anyone in the whole world. I met someone this past week who's a, a great author. I emailed him two weeks ago, said, hey, I'd love to thank you for your book and love just to talk. And 15 minutes, he emailed me back. I'm like, wow, we met this past week, and it's like, wow. And he has a story. He has a story about being unloved. And it's taken him nearly 50 years of his life to truly understand how much God loves him. If you feel that way today, you're not alone. You don't need to go through this life that, like that. You don't need to know that you're alone because that's too lonely. Every heart in this room, you've been broken by something. But you have the opportunity today, every day, for God to heal you. So Elijah was causing trouble. And like what Pastor Brian was saying last week, I can surely identify Pastor Tony Evans. Because as I wrote this sermon this week, I could hear Tony just screaming in my ear. And I love it. So what did Elijah say when Ahab was, you know, there's a troublemaker? What was Elijah's response? He first responds by his integrity. He says, I have not made trouble for Israel. He points Ahab to the truth. That's what he does. This is what you can say when, when defiance is staring you down. I have not come to tr cause trouble. So if we tell our kids, well, so-and-so called me a blueberry. You're not a blueberry. You're Jonathan. You're Luke. God's called you as, by name as, your, as his kid. Second, Elijah puts the responsibility back on Ahab. And he says, but you have. You see that? It's not there yet. <laughs> but it's in there. It's in there. You praying with me? Tony Evans says. Second, he puts the responsibility back on Ahab. I've not made trouble for Israel, but you have. But you have. Third, he's transparent and he holds him accountable. He says, you have abandoned the Lord. 
My childhood, in my childhood, maybe like you, we grew up with no fences. Remember that? No fences. Everybody can see and hear what you're doing. Your parents, the next door neighbors, until you go over to that little part of the garden. Who's ever done that? You ever done that in the front or backyard? You've been doing something that you shouldn't have been doing in your yard, and somebody looks over the fence, they go, hey! <laughs> it wasn't like a, oh, hi, hey, sweet child, come on over here. It's more of a, hey, boy! This, my dad had three different names for us kids. I have an uh, older sister and a brother. I'm the baby. He's got, he had three names for us, for, for actually for Rick and I. It was, it was either he called you by your name, or he called you son, or boy, or daughter, right? And the last name he had for us was Fella. He even called my sister Fella. I mean, that was strong. So like when he said the word, you know, get on over here, Fella, you knew he meant business. And that's kind of the way that Ahab was trying to talk to Elijah. But Elijah just had that downright response of no. So God is speaking this through Elijah, trying to get Ahab, the children of Israel, to listen, to pay attention. Elijah was in a quest for getting God's children to turn back to God, to return the worship to God, not to himself. You know, Elijah could have had every opportunity in the world for, th for him to say, you know what, you need to turn back to God, so you're going to follow me. You know, Elijah never said that. Elijah always pointed the truth back to God himself. Choose today to follow God. That's what Elijah did. Now, we have our text. Elijah went before the people and said, how long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. But the people said nothing. The people said nothing. Here you got Elijah on the scene, called by God, going into the land. He's speaking God's truth, and the people said nothing. It's like today when you see a bad accident. Oh, I'm glad that didn't happen to me. Someone had cancer. Oh, I'm, I better just be quiet because I'm too uncomfortable to say something. said nothing. Waver. What does it mean to waver? To be undecided between two opinions. To waver means maybe a, a possession of an indecision among two different courses of action. The indecision that Elijah was denouncing was for the people to stop following Baal, stop worshiping him, start choosing God. But they were being swayed by empty promises that Baal could never provide or that Ahab could never provide. We could say that about ourselves, empty dreams, washed up dreams, unfulfilled desires, unsatisfaction, but none of these, none of these can provide stability, security, safety. The five basic elements to a surviving human is air, water, food, shelter, and sleep. Again, false gods promise what only the true God provides. Number two, false gods promise only what they would like for you to pray. Worship is, let's just say this, when it comes to worship and learning how to, I think worship and prayer go hand in hand. They do. You know why? Because prayer is the gateway to worship. It's like saying the word hello to someone you love or a friend. That's the gateway of fellowship, isn't it? Because it's what happens after that. It's after when you say hello. Or do you close the gates on the person and you don't have that conversation? I know even pastors that don't want to talk to their own families on Sunday because they feel that they work too hard. That's a shame. There's people everywhere I don't want you to get close that may close the doors on you too. That's a shame. Teachers, people that you respect, close their doors on you every day. When it comes to worship, God's gates are open wide. He says, seek me and you will be found by me. See, let's understand about what worship is. I've mentioned this before, if maybe you remember back in August, I preach the sermon about worship. Worship is not a song. 
Worship is not something that we do in the church. Worship is an authentic response to God according to who he is from Scripture. Worship is not about how big you make it. Worship is not even what you think it ought to be like. It's what God says it is. Worship is not about this church. It's not about what we do in this church. It's not about how great we make the stage look, how big we make the signs, because that all points back to us, right? Look what I did. No, it's look at what God did. That's what Elijah was saying to Ahab and the people. He said, no, you need to look at who God is and what God is doing. It's interesting. As I began the study, we see the same parallel. Brian, you'd appreciate this. Genesis chapter 4 to John chapter 4. In Genesis chapter 4, we have Cain. He was too concerned about his pride rather than offering to God worship. And so was the woman at the well. She was way too concerned about where to worship God versus worshiping God. We do the same thing. But in those both scenarios, they were caught up in what false, what worship what they thought was. And this is what God still says today to us, as he said to Cain, but if you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, he tells Cain, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, God says, but you must rule over it. And this is exactly what Elijah was trying to tell Ahab. But Ahab in his, in his own arrogance tried to do it his way. So Elijah says, okay, let's put it to a test. How about you and your God, Baal? You do what you need to do. You call on your God, and let's see, he comes down. And Elijah and, and, Elijah and his people said, we're going to call on our God. So they had this, like, lip sync battle contest. What I was joking about with Sasha this weekend and Heather. Elijah says, then you call on the name of your God, and I will call on the name of the Lord. You see that? He says, the name of your God. didn't even have a name. Elijah knew who he was, but Elijah didn't even say the name Baal. He just said, the name of your God. Lower him down here. We're going to call the name of the Lord. That's the name right there. The God who answers by fire, he is God. That all the people said, what you say is good. That's right. It's like after you have a good meal, you're like, mm, that is good. You know? I have this saying that um, worship does begin with food, you know, after prayer, right? That's why we say amen. Ahab. But Ahab was trying to turn people away from God. On the other hand, Ahab was trying to turn people to himself. It's like we've heard this. Who said this before? All of this I'll give you, he said, if you fall down and worship me. Those are the words from Satan that he told Jesus in Matthew 4.10. Same thing. History repeats itself. Nothing different. Nothing new under the sun. Sounds like a lot like everything that we face every day. Fantasy, false reality, power, addiction. We don't like to call things what they really are, but they are. Oh, well, this, this is not what I have. I, I know this has happened in my life, but it's not that big of a deal. It is a big deal. The bigger deal is, are you going to allow God to come in and heal you one layer at a time like the onion? It's uncomfortable. But there we have Jesus himself who provides our comfort. So then what are the promises of God? Hebrews 4, 1, entering his rest. John 8, 38, Jesus says, freedom. If it is the son that sets you free, you are free indeed. Colossians 1, 14, forgiveness in Christ Jesus, whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. John 10, 10, Jesus says, receiving life. 
I, who, I have come to give life abundantly. Thus, we choose what is true. But any time that you feel like you just want the easy way out, it's just an easy lie. Any time you want to make a shortcut, it's going to end up long and the hard way. So in life, you are faced with two choices. To pray to do the right thing or pray and do the wrong thing. That's right. You pray when you do the wrong thing. Well, I know I shouldn't be doing this. You're not praying to God. You may be. Well, God, I make all these excuses, but you do it anyway. Interesting. From King, 1 Kings chapter 18 through 19, we get, in this story even, you can hear the words of Joshua 24, 15, where Joshua says, Choose this day whom you will serve. It's all over. Much of us think, well, yeah, but I don't, I don't want to read my Bible that much to know these things. That's what pastors do. No, it's not. It's not what pastors do. You, only, you, only, you, know, you know the only reason why we're here? It's because God said. And when we do what we do because what God says. You do what you do in your work and in your school because what God says. But that doesn't exempt you from knowing the Bible. It doesn't exempt you from knowing his word. Did you know, did you know that the word of God is his word for you to know about himself? Why regulate that onto somebody else? Well, that's somebody else's job. We do that, right? Chico and the man. That's not my job. You know? <laughs> yeah, sorry. That was, some of you may not even know what I'm talking about. That was way long ago. I'm surprised I even know. Resist. You know, call me dumb, but finally I looked up what that hashtag actually meant. Resist. You know, in the back of people's cars. But that's exactly what we like to do. We like to resist what God already calls us to do. So you know what I read when, when I found out the word, what resist means, you know, hashtag resist, resist? I read it and it said, resist chocolate chip cookies. I can't do that. <laughs> Anytime you resist God, you find yourself in a war with God. This is not the battle you want to fight. Because that's the battle of the world. You don't want to fight that battle because you lose every time. Which we must choose God. We must choose to pray to him. Choose today to pray to God. So now Elijah challenges Ahab. I've read this already. But so they took the bull given to them and prepared it. Then they called on the name of Baal from morning till noon. That's a long time. From morning till noon. Could you imagine waiting all day for your God to show up? It is like from morning to noon, you're like, come on now. I mean, at least your pastor's only five minutes late to the sermon, right? But here, morning till noon, oh, Baal, answer us, they shouted. <laughs> Sounds kind of polite in itself. Oh, Baal, please answer us. But there was no response. No one answered. And they danced around the altar they had made. Elijah is just watching this. There's no mention of Elijah here. You see that? Isn't that cool? Elijah, the whole time, watching them dance around their fire, trying to call on Baal from morning till noon. Check it out. And at noon, verse 27, Elijah began to taunt them. Shout louder, he said. Surely he is a God, right? Perhaps he is in deep thought or busy or traveling or maybe, maybe he's sleeping and he must be awakened. <laughs> That's what the word says. <laughs> it's comical. So Ahab and his people were praying to a God that was powerless, that had no life. 
It had nothing in them. Your Facebook status has no power. It has nothing in it. Psalms 115 says this about those who choose false worship, praying to a man-made God. This is what God's word says in Psalm 115. Their idols are silver and gold, listen to this, made by the hands of men. They have mouths but cannot speak. They have eyes but cannot see. They have ears but cannot hear. They have noses but cannot smell. They have hands that cannot feel. They have feet that cannot walk. They cannot even clear their throats. Those who make them will be like them, as do all who trust in him. He's talking about Baal. It's funny how the very thing that we fear are the very things that actually have no power in them at all, except the power that you give it. We have a really good friend of our family that says that it won't have any power over you unless you give it power. Someone's walking around you in your office or school or, or any other place, and they're like, hmm. They look at you, and what you do, not oh, no. They had this prejudgment on you already. You know what? You have the power to not give them power. But once you do, they have power over you. It's like what God said to Cain. You must rule over it. Ahab didn't understand that. Like Jesus saying to the disciples in Mark 8.18, do you have eyes but fail to see and ears but fail to hear? Do you not remember? God is trying to wake us up. He's trying to wake us up from our slumber. Do you get that, church? God is hitting the alarm clock today, and what are you doing? What am I doing? God is trying to bring to light all the things that we put in the dark. Are you going to allow God to come in and turn that light on? Or does he have to do it another way? I don't want that way. Because that way is what actually happened. And we go here to our third point. Choose today to worship God. At the time of the sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward and prayed, O Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and have done all these things at your command. Answer me, O Lord, answer me, so these people will know you, O Lord, O God, and that you are turning their hearts back again. Then scripture says, then the fire of the Lord fell and burned upon the sacrifice. The wood, the stones, and the soil all licked it up like water in the trench. And when all the people saw this, they fell prostrate on the ground and cried, the Lord, he is God. So just imagine... This light in the Old Testament burn as a sacrifice and glory of God. Israel now prays to God because they have seen the light and fire that God burned. Do you see what God is burning in you today? Israel now prays to God. When all the people saw it, who else in this text, including, implies all the people? All the people. All the people. Look, all the people. You know who that includes? Ahab. Right? Scripture didn't say all people except Ahab. It says all the people, even Ahab, bowed to the ground. One day, every tongue, every knee will confess that he is God. Even if you're running from it right today, if you are still running from the very thing that you know you shouldn't be doing, if you're still running away from that identity to who Jesus called you to be, one day it will catch up with you. It will either be in this life or the next in which all of us will have to give an account. I don't mean account. I don't mean, let's be careful here. For those of us who are saved in Jesus Christ, we don't face judgment, but we do face accountability. God will ask us, what did you do with the body and the life that I gave you? You want to stand there just doing nothing? 
Or do you want to be doing something today? Church, it's time to get serious. Upwards Church, here in this community, what are we doing? What are we doing? It's like God saying, hey boy, girl, what are you doing? Well, I just figured I'd be over here and play my little game. So when was the last time or the first time that you, maybe this is the first time that you allow the light of Christ to come in to your heart and heal what is wounded? Maybe from what somebody said or what somebody did. But God is wanting you to bring, what is, what is God wanting you to bring to the fire to be burned today? What is it that maybe you spent your whole life building that God is saying, okay, then call on it then and let's see if it calls you back or are you going to call the name of the Lord? John 1, 5, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. John 12, 36, believe in the light while you have the light so that you may become children of light. Ephesians 5, 8, for once you were in darkness, but now you are in the light in the Lord. John 8, 12, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Regardless of our sin, God still burns the fire. Maybe this is the first time that you really need to trust him to know that he's God. Maybe it took everything within you until today where you realize who you choose to worship, who the one true God really is. He's been with you all along who has never let you go, who has seen every tear that you cried, who has heard every word you didn't say. And he's still speaking to you today because he loves you deeply. He loves you deeply. Scripture is very clear. I've never seen scripture that wasn't. about putting down false idols in our lives and reminds us once again why we are to choose to worship God who deeply loves us. I want to close with Romans 1.18. Because everything else in you today for all these years has been a lie to you except the truth of God or the truth of those who live by it or those who speak truth in you or your family. Maybe you've had that trusted person in your life. Maybe you've had that dishonest person in your life. I have. Did you know that I was broken? I was broken in many ways by people that I loved only to find out that they really didn't love me. But you know what I did find? that God was always there and always loved me despite of what anybody else had ever said about me or done to me. You are God's kid. You are a child of God. You're his kid. He's the God that you can wake up to every night and run downstairs and say, Daddy, hold me. Father, I need you. It could be 2 a.m. in the morning, 3 a.m. in the morning for you at night when no one else is listening to what's being said or spoken, but you do, and you hear it in your heart. And for the life of you, you cannot let it go. But you can. But you can. I love it in Scripture where every time when you read through it about the Horrible things have happened to man. And then you have this comma, but God. Because that's what it means. Everything else in this life that has happened to you, but God. So let me read this. 
Romans 1, 18 through 21, 23, 25 says, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood from what was made so that people are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal man, being birds and animals and reptiles. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped, served created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. Amen. Worshiping the false gods will never provide what God already has. So who do you choose to worship? Who do you choose to worship? Heavenly Father, you are so good. Your greatness surpasses our understanding. In the ways in which we have lived, your light has always shined from every darkness that we've been surrounded by. And God, only you, only you love us the way that you've intended love to be. Father, how can we choose other things in this world or life that have no other praise than what holds to you? For you are the one true God, Almighty Father, our Prince of Peace. You're the God of the kingdom. You're the God of our hearts. So, Father, Please help us choose you daily. And that one day, as scripture says, we will forever be with the Lord. And until then, Lord, help us to live lives that are worthy to you. Father, right now, I pray for any soul in this room who does not have a relationship with you. And you know who you are. So all you need to do is just pray this prayer after me. Say, dear Jesus, please forgive me of my sins. Forgive me for the wrongs that I've done. Thank you for sinning, and I believe that you sent your son, Jesus, to die upon a cross for me. And I receive you as Lord and ask you, Jesus, come into my heart. Make me whole. Make your home within me. Thank you for raising me from the dead. Thank you. I believe that you raised from the dead. Let your Holy Spirit now live in me. And you say in Jesus' name, Father, I pray that there was someone here today that took upon that truth and made it their own in their heart. And Father, I pray for each one of us today as we heard these words from you, that you would come now as you walked off the pages of the scripture, we walk now in the pages of our heart and to go out into a real world to show real love and real truth to people, even when we think that they don't deserve it. It's because we thought the same thing. But you gave it to us because we deserve it through Jesus Christ. 
thank you for this time. And we commit all these things to you.